Thanks, Jesse, and, um, and, and I really want to thank the uh, organisers of this conference for, for putting it on, for starters. I mean, it's been a, a wonderful conference to, to be at and, and to sit and reflect on things and think about different ways of practice. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've the, the, it's such a different sort of conference to others that I've been at. It's been uh, a great place to be. Um, so I'm very excited to be part of it as one of the speakers. And what I wanted to talk about today was a little bit of thinking around clinical decision making in infectious diseases. And I, um, I as, as Jesse said, I'm an infectious diseases paediatrician. I work as a general paediatrician, an infectious diseases physician, what I might refer to as the upstairs docs. And I also work as an emergency physician, one of the downstairs docs. And it, it strikes me that there's often quite a difference in thinking around these children who present with fever and infection um, in acute care. Um, I know as an upstairs doc, what, what I want is for a child to be sort of presented to me um, all wrapped up nicely, uh, tests all done, IV in, treatment started. As a downstairs doc, I know that it's not as simple as that. And what happens is that we are dealing in the emergency department with a number of different infections and uh, kids with fever and having to try and decipher which of them are the ones that are sick and which of the ones that uh, we can easily say they're fine. So what I want to talk about is which of those kids we can uh, easily decide and with, with a sort of the thinking about rapid thinking that we can make a decision quickly about the way to manage them and which we need to take a pause and take a bit more time and how we might manage that. It's quite easy if we've got a child that looks like this, we all know that this is a sick child and I can immediately decide that I can rapid, I need to make it a quick decision and rapid management plan. Likewise, with a child like this, they present with a fever and infection to the emergency department and I look and think, okay, this is pretty easy, I know how to deal with this. And what the ch children that I have angst about are these ones, all the ones in between. The kids who present with fever and infection who it's a bit difficult to discern how sick they are and whether I need to do a whole lot of investigations and start treatment or whether I can go ahead and uh, manage, observe without doing anything. And that's, that's where the real difficulty lies and the thing that I struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis in paediatric acute care. We know that, uh, okay, we know that fever is a really common thing in children. Uh, it makes up up to about a third of the presentations to the emergency department. And most of those kids are going to have a virus. A small proportion of the remainder will have a simple bacterial infection. The vast majority, uh, uh, sorry, the, and the very, very tiny minority are going to have a serious bacterial infection. So we can use the data to some extent to say, okay, well, most of the kids we see we don't need to do terribly much about. There's a very small proportion that we need to think about uh, maybe in a bit more detail and deal with more quickly. Fortunately, in Australia, with immunisation over the last 20 years or so, we've seen a rapid, a, a, a big reduction in serious bacterial infection. And this slide shows that the slide for meningitis in, with the development of um, the introduction of Haemophilus vaccine, various meningococcal vaccines and pneumococcal vaccines over the last little while. But the same can be shown, the same sort of slide would be there for bacteremia and other serious bacterial infections. So using this, we know that already we can, the vast majority of kids we see, it's only going to be a very small proportion that we really need to worry about. This study was a really big study done by the Kaiser Permanente Group in California. These guys took over 200,000 children aged between one week and three months over a seven year period. And every single one of them was entered into the study. All of those with fever had blood cultures, urine cultures or CSF cultures and they collected the data. So over 200,000 children, fantastic big study. In this group of children, there were over 5,000 blood cultures done and the bacteremia rate was very low, only 2%. Around 1,800 of them had 
CSF cultures taken, and the rate of meningitis was only 0.9%, less than 1%. And around 4,500 kids had urine cultures taken, and this was a relatively large number. 17% of them had urinary tract infections. So we know that urine infections, if we see a child with a fever infection, most of them will have a virus, as I said. A small number will have something like otitis or a throat infection. And of the, the remainder, the majority of them are going to have a urine infection. And if the overall results from this study showed that the serious bacterial infection rate was 3.75 per thousand, so only less than 0.3%, around 0.3%, and the vast majority of those children had a urinary tract infection. So when we see a child in the emergency department, what that means, when I, when I see a child, what it means is, to me is that I know that I can do nothing more than a urine in the vast majority of them. And in fact, even that may not be necessary to do in a big hurry. We know that most children with a urine infection don't become seriously unwell. Most don't de develop serious sepsis. And nowadays, most of the kids who do have a urine infection diagnosed, don't have, there's no implication other than to treat it, of course, with antibiotics, but there's no other implication. There's a very small number of children nowadays in whom we do an ultrasound to follow up. Uh, it's really only the young males under about the age of three months in, in some centres, and my practice has changed. I only do the, uh, ultrasounds in babies under the age of one month to check for obstruct obstructive uropathy. So all of the others who have a urine infection the most of them are not going to get terribly unwell and there's not going to be any other implications. So that means that we can most likely delay out management and not do any investigations at all in some kids. We, we all know how difficult it can be to, to get a urine in the emergency department. It can be really tricky. And the number of times I'm walking the floor when I'm in the department and wanting to see which patients are there and I walk into a bay and one bay after another, you walk in and there's a baby sitting there like this, nothing on. <laughs> parent with a, the urine cup on the perineum and the child is waiting there with the family for hours sometimes for a, a urine test to be done. So what I want to suggest is that most children we see with a fever and, and, in, and without an obvious focus in the emergency department need nothing more than a urine and even getting the urine could potentially be delayed. One, there have been various people now who suggest that maybe in a child with fever and no obvious focus uh, we can potentially delay for four or five days the diagnosis without there being any harm. And that would mean that rather than keep a child in the emergency department for longer than is necessary, we can potentially send them home with the aim of getting a urine after the event. What about prediction rules? Well, there are many of these, the Boston, the Rochester, the Yale rules. The trouble is that many centres have worked on these rules for their own centre. They've used different ranges of uh, clinical features, different investigation results, either a CRP, procalcitonin, white cell count, various combinations, various levels of white cell count and so on. There is no single prediction rule, although that would be the holy grail, there is none that can reliably pick a child with a serious bacterial infection. They're pretty good at ruling out serious bacterial infection, but I want to contend that we can do that clinically to, to a greater extent. And uh, they're not very good at telling us which are the ones that are seriously unwell. So unfortunately, the prediction rules are not going to be the way of, to go at the moment. Hopefully, in the future, with, with, as tests become cheaper and with uh, different ranges of things, it may be possible, but not at the moment. It would be a nice idea, perhaps, to have a, a robot who, that could make that diagnosis. We could plug in some information and it would be the same as with the prediction rules. We could have a prediction rule, plug a whole lot of information into a computer and out pops, you, this is a child that needs treatment, this is a child that doesn't. And there are some who suggest that artificial intelligence is going to be the way of the future. There was an article in the, in the local paper, The Age, just last week suggesting that this was the way of the future for a number of conditions. I drive a car that, that um, has got predictive cruise control it stops and starts and drives itself virtually. It parks itself now. And there are cars around the world now that don't you know, virtually drive themselves. But none of them can tell, you know, they, my car stops when there's something in front of it, but it can't tell what actually that is in front of it. And it would potentially veer to, and smash into a car when in front of it was not a child or a person. And the same with this. I don't think a robot at the moment is going to be able to tell us which child has got a fever 
infection and has a serious bacterial infection. So we're not there yet. So I think that we need to go from where we, from the future, and I'd like to think that one day we'll have a prediction rule, we can plug things in and we can make a diagnosis, but for the time being, I think we need to rely on practical wisdom and, and in fact go from the future all the way back to 300 BC to Aristotle, who talked about this term phronesis, which was, in his words, practical wisdom, or perhaps we might see it as clinical judgment. Clinical judgment is a tacit thing and it's difficult to tease out but I want to talk a little bit about how I approach children when I see them in the emergency department. And to begin with, and in thinking about the hare and the tortoise, I want to think about this book by Daniel Kahneman. He's an economist who won the Nobel Prize in e economics, and many of you will have heard of his work, and that Kevin McCaffrey uh, talked about it the other day a little bit. He was talking about bias, um, if you could get past the kilt as he jumped up on stage. But in this book, Daniel Kahneman talks about weighs the psychology of decision-making, the psychology of thinking. And he talks about thinking fast and thinking slow. Thinking fast is what I think as we become more experienced, we do a bit more of. It's an intuitive way of, of thinking, coming up with a decision quickly. And it's based on perhaps a lot of personal experience and previous experience, but coming up with a diagnosis quite quickly. The other way of thinking slow is more deliberative, more analytical. As a matter of fact, good clinical judgment is the combination of these two. We need to know when we can draw on that previous information. Now, I've got enough grey hair to say that I've been around long enough to have a bit of clinical experience, to have seen a few children with fever and infection, and to be able to sort of maybe make a quick judgment about whether it's a child who's sick or not sick. But what I try and do when I'm on the floor is also empower young doctors to do the same, to trust their clinical judgment, to, be, to make a decision and try and stick by that decision based on their clinical judgment and not resort immediately to doing tests to try and help make a decision. These guys, and, and there's been quite a lot of work done on this, talk about a third track of thinking. There's the fast and slow thinking, but there's a third track, gut feeling. And you know, you often hear people saying, trust your gut. Well, as a matter of fact, there's quite a lot of evidence for this, but it's more about recognising red flags. And the red flags that I think about, I guess, when I come in and see a child, is the parents who've returned for the second time with their child with a fever, something in the history that just doesn't quite add up. That, so something that's a red flag that makes me think, this is a child I just need to pause a bit. I need to go from my quick, quick decision-making and maybe slow it down a bit use a bit more analysis and be a bit more deliberative, maybe go back and re-go re over the history, examine the child again. So we need to do trust our gut, and I think it's reasonable to do, but it, what it is is a recognition of red flags to bring us back to slowing down our thinking and, and slow, slowing down our decision-making. Regardless of all of this clinical judgment and how we make decisions, there is always going to be uncertainty. There's always going to be uncertainty in all the, in clinical medicine and all that we do. And, in, and of course, the frame here for many of us is, I don't want to miss the really sick child. I don't want them to come back the next day with meningococcal disease and be sick and die, something like that. The thing is that unless we embrace uncertainty, unless we accept that there is uncertainty in clinical medicine, take the opportunity to make a decision and deal with that, we're not going to be able to move on very well. And there's some, a couple of guys in the States, Charlie Lawler, Lawler or Lawrence Liu, and many others, who've looked at uncertainty, but I really like Charlie Lawler's way of thinking about it. He thinks about uncertainty from a sort of a medical model, making the diagnosis of uncertainty, the prognosis or implications of uncertainty, and the treatment of uncertainty. And I think about this a lot when I'm in the emergency department, in the chaotic environment, there's a lot happening, and there's, I'm looking after a number of patients at once and trying to make decisions, and there's uncertainty all around. The first thing is to diagnose it, to recognise that there is uncertainty. Some of that might be informational uncertainty, so I haven't got enough information or I don't understand the information. And that, of course, can be dealt with to some extent by going back and getting more information or sharing with someone else and getting someone, a colleague, one of the a really valuable resource for all of us, uh, for me anyway, is senior nursing staff who come in and hearing what they think might be going on. 
So sharing uncertainty, diagnosing it and dealing with it by sharing it. The prognosis is really important too. In our, the implications of uncertainty might be that there are added costs, that we delay treatment, that we keep patients in the emergency department longer than we should because we aren't prepared to come up with a diagnosis. Now this is maybe something that we can use thoughtfully and we in our emergency department, I think most around the place now have an ED short stay unit. And the use of the ED short stay unit can really be valuable in this space because we can keep a child there for a period of time, slow our thinking down and observe them for a period of time to try and work out what our thoughts are. But there are implications of them. We have to, we've, we've only got a certain number of beds. We can't do that for all the, the third of the patients who, that we see in the emergency department who are presenting with fever infection. So we do need to make sure that we don't use the ED short stay as a delaying tactic from actually coming up with the decision. We need to manage our anxiety and the way that we tr treat our anxiety, the way we manage it, I think, is by sharing it. And what I mean by that is not sharing it to the extent that you make it clear to your family that you don't know what the hell is going on and you're really un an uncertain person and don't know how to deal with it, but rather that you engage in shared decision making. And that might include colleagues. It might, it might mean that you bounce it off uh, another colleague in the department, you ask someone else, as I say, you ask uh, a member of nursing staff or someone else who's seeing that patient as well, what their impression is and whether or not it may be worth delving in a bit more. But it's also the shared decision making with the family. Re tell, explaining to them that there is uncertainty, that it's not clear what's going on, that <clears throat> we can um, nonetheless move forward, make a decision and move forward with a treatment plan. And the other treatment for uncertainty is safety netting or contingency plans. And so this is where in that shared decision making, we make a decision with a family that although they've got a fever and infection, we're not 100% certain what's going on. We've used the data to know, well, we've narrowed, we've whittled things down, so it's very unlikely it's a serious bacterial infection. It's most likely going to be something else. And what we're going to do is have some sort of review process. This is where the ED short stay can be used, I guess, for watching for a period of time. But for the most, we can use some safety netting with the family to say, come back for review tomorrow, see the GB tomorrow and use our clinical judgment to say, okay, we're making this decision when we don't need to do more investigations. We don't need to start treatment necessarily. Another contingency plan that can be really helpful is to admit and observe a child. And that might, again, might be saying that that might be a delaying tactic in some ways, but what it does do is say, we don't need to investigate, we don't need to treat, but the management here is perhaps doing nothing, is just observation. So when I see these children with fever and infection and I'm not sure what's going on, I resort to clinical judgment. I resort to the use of the, my experience but also thinking about what I know from the data and use that to make, come up with a decision that I share with the family. I accept that there's uncertainty, I manage that uncertainty and share the decision making with the family. So we need to use data as far as it can take us and that will tell us that the, the likelihood of a serious bacterial infection is very low. And for the most part, we can move on thinking that it's unlikely to be that, unless there's a red flag. We need to use our clinical judgment. And I really urge young doctors and nurses to use their clinical judgment to back themselves. Use a combination of, it might be for you as someone more junior that you haven't got a lot of experience, but you've certainly seen patients or you've been, seen them in lectures or tutorials and so on, use those illness scripts that you've seen about patients and use those to help you make a decision. If necessary, find a friend and discuss it with them. But be prepared to trust your gut as well. And if you see a red flag, maybe slow down your thinking and take your time at making a decision. That doesn't necessarily mean though to do more investigations or start treatment. I think it's really important to acknowledge the uncertainty, as I say, share it and sh make shared decision making, both with colleagues and with families. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that doing nothing doesn't mean that nothing is being done. Observation is a very powerful thing. Safety netting is really important. And in that way, we can safely treat children with fe fever and infection. 
Thanks very much. Thank you, Mike, and thanks for dealing with a bit of uncertainty yourself during that presentation with a yeah. little bit of uh, My the slides. <laughs> yes, handled it like a pro, so yeah, thank no. you very much, and <laughs> our apologies on that one. No, no, um, it's me. So, but there was a hell of a lot of love for you on Twitter and um, a few questions also. Thanks, so, yep. Henry. Absolutely, Mike, that was a fantastic talk. Um, and I should say that the, the buzz of the actual content of the talk has far supervened over the photos from last night, so good work, everybody. Um, you know, it's obviously a testament to the good Wi-Fi we've got. Um, one of the suggestions is that Mike change his first name to Rock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I haven't heard that. But, but in general, the, the Twitter sphere was um, they were very much on board and identifying with the idea of embracing uncertainty. And a lot of the challenge, as you identified in the back half of your talk, was about um, holding in tension the, that uncertainty with the expectations not only of ourselves and our peers within our local department, but also that of the community, and in particular for children who we might be trying to have admitted to hospital, the admitting teams, and how we uh, can cross between the boundaries of teams in tolerating uncertainty. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's, that's uh, yeah, a lovely question, and I think, or a lovely um, observation, there, there is, there's uncertainty at all of those levels. And it is, I think, something that, um, as I sort of said at the beginning, I mean, as an upstairs doctor working in, you know, the patients have already been admitted and a lot of the decision making has been done. There's still anxiety as it moves on. But uh, I, w something I see all the time is that, you know, uh, I'll, I'll ring up myself. I've seen a patient and I've made a decision that they need to be admitted but have no, uh, just be observed. And the registrar on the medical team upstairs, I'm working as a downstairs doctor, the registrar says, I'd like you to do a nasal, nasal swab and some blood tests and this, that and the other. And managing that anxiety is really important, trying to share with them. And, some, and, and there are many times, because I know that that doctor upstairs is the one who's going to be dealing with the patient for the next few days, that I, and, and I encourage the other doctors in the emergency department to consider that frame as well. And to, pos you know, Again, as a part of shared decision making, it has to be done with the family as well. It may be a matter of coming back and saying, look, we've talked with our team about this and we do need to do this test or that test. I, I think that it is important to acknowledge the uncertainty of others, help them try to deal with it and encourage them perhaps, from my point of view anyway, uh, as someone who, who, who might be a bit more experienced, I try and encourage people to not immediately act by doing investigations and treatment. But I, that, there obviously, it is a shared process and we're, we have to acknowledge that different people have got a, a different frame. And then with the families, of course, there is out, out, outside the community and we don't, it's on the front pages of the papers all the time, things about uh, meningococcal disease or some other thing that strikes fear in, in families. And so they've got this uncertainty about, well, how do I know that my child is, is not going to be the one who's going to be very unwell and come back tomorrow very unwell? And they hear the stories about that and, and I guess that, that's something we have to try and hold, hold together with the family and, and make a, a safety netting plan that, that fits for them. That, that, might, that might be that you keep them there for a bit longer or see them earlier or whatever it might be. I don't think it should mean that you immediately do a whole lot of stuff. Excellent. I might just direct to one of the in the room questions and then we'll come back to that. Hey, so, Shabs. Shabs. hey Mike. Thank you. Hi, Mike. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on how we can support and teach our medical, nursing, allied health students about dealing with uncertainty and the same for our junior staff. Thanks. Well, that, that's a, a, that is a difficult question, um, I think, because it is a difficult thing to teach. I know the guys at McMaster have done a lot of work trying to, to, to talk about uncertainty and have, um, po you know, in, in sort of simulated environments, pose um, scenarios and have uh, that are that are clearly have got uncertain you know, different pathways and then talk those through and, and particularly talk to junior doctors and nurses about um, how there is uncertainty recognizing it talking about that stuff that you know recognizing it and being prepared to work with it um, I think in, in something that I do is, you know, tra junior doctors will often come and present a patient to me, and I, uh, I guess I've pegged them 
to start off with as to whether I feel that they can manage things, but I'll often empower them to make the decisions on their own, to try to give them the opportunity to work through that themselves, but just hovering around in the background to um, support them if they're, if they're struggling. And, and I guess, ultimately, um, I don't know that I'm really answering your question about how to teach it, but I think that one of the ways is to empower young doctors and nurses to go out on their own, do it themselves, but be there to, to give them some support in the background. Excellent. Um, might go over here. You've been waiting very patiently. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as a junior doctor, I've often found that, you know, in the middle of the night you're seeing these patients and if I'm doing a blood culture, I'm very tempted to just throw in a CRP to push me one way or the other. Um, how do you see the use of CRP in the ED department? How do you use it to influence your decision making with these middle ground cases? Thanks for that question. As you're, you're, people have noticed, I did not really mention CRP. And, <laughs> or Procal's not these. I mean, I mentioned them in passing. Um, so look, there are a lot of data around the use of CRP for risk stratification. And uh, I think the, the, in the acute setting for most children with fever and infection, CRP in most studies has not been shown to be a reliable marker of who's got serious bacterial infection and who does not. It is a better predictor in neonates, and so there may be a case in neonates in whom, and I, I didn't really focus on neonates here, they're a group who we tend to investigate a bit more and treat more empirically because it's much more difficult to use our clinical judgment. But even then, I think that we increasingly can. But um, I, I don't think that the CRP, well, the CRP has not been shown, it's not that I don't think it has not been shown to be a reliable predictor of serious bacterial infection on its own or even with a white cell count or with various other clinical features. Um, so I, I, unfortunately, I don't think that is the, that, that I, we, we do it. In fact, you know, I, I run our clinical practice guidelines at the children's hospital that are, that are, are used around the place and we've, we're just at the moment reviewing the febrile child one, the person who's been doing the writing I've noticed in the audience and we've had a lot of arguments about where, you know, how to have a guideline, which is another safety netting thing, to, to, to tell young doctors how to, to manage kids with fever infection. And um, th there's no clear answer at the moment. Right. I know it's pushing us over time, but I really want to hear Kevin's question to you, Mike, <laughs> as well. Sorry, Mike. Uh, excellent talk. Thank you very much. Um, uh, if I can sneak two in, if that's not too much like sabotage. Um, um, your thoughts, uh, I often, when I'm talking to my staff about uncertainty, uh, I'll use a concept of um, comfortable versus uncomfortable uncertainty, and that links into the gut feeling. Sometimes you look at somebody and you think, I'm not sure quite what's going on, but I see this, 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 and this, which sort of reassures me, and I can just sit back, and I feel I can watch a bit longer, whereas for some patients you think, I don't know what's going on, and I don't like what I'm seeing, and for me, I would always suggest you escalate that, first of all, to somebody else for a cognitive check, second opinion, and potentially other investigations. I just wondered if that sort of gels with um, some of the things you were talking about. Yeah, look, I, I, it does, Kevin, and also another thing that you talked about, you were talking about the Dunning-Kruger effect, or some, certainly that's been mentioned a couple of times, and that's a bit of that, you know, that sometimes there's that, it, there, you just know that there's something that's not right, and yes, that's, and that, I guess that's also the fast thinking, it's, there's this gut and the combination of the gut feeling that makes you feel something's not right, I need to slow down, I might need to observe for I need to do more, um, that you, you just have this sense that something, and other times, yes, you, you, I, I can see that there's uncertainty, but I'm not worried about it, so yes. that, I think that fits very nicely. And, and very quickly, my second question, uh, there is a big push all around the world on um, sepsis campaigns and tools for um, immediate rapid escalation with investigation and therapy for suspected sepsis and with the nature of the beast they set the bar very very low I suspect I know what your thoughts might be on this process but I, but I, I thought I'd ask out loud yeah well thanks Kevin yes so uh, we've had certain discussions in our department I think that there's no doubt that you know if you've got a, a child who is truly septic that we need to act quickly and uh, a lot of the work that Elliot Long has done and, and in our department, you know, we, had, we got to the point that I wasn't comfortable with where our excellent nursing staff at triage virtually were almost, there was a line in and fluids and antibiotics given virtually before I'd had a chance to see a child. And then some of them, many of them would come through and I thought, well, this is a child that isn't that sick actually. I mean, they've got a fever, sure, and they look a bit unwell, but they don't have sepsis. And of course, trying to 
pick that is difficult. But I, I think that things, it's important for that to swing based on some of the adult data, but we actually don't have the paediatric data, I don't think, that support really jumping in in all these patients in that way. Uh, the vast majority of children who've died on us have been described as sitting up in bed looking quite well, sometimes texting on phones as close as four hours before they arrest and die. So um, just putting it out there, I think it's very contentious. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Might be a good place to stop, eh? Yes. Um, <laughs> I've got to park my question. <laughs>